Thank you to our DOE leadership for that lively discussion. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm Lucia Tien, Senior Advisor to the DOE's Chief Commercialization Officer. For the rest of the session, my colleagues and I will walk you through an early peek into our upcoming liftoff report for industrial decarbonization across a range of industrial sectors. This webinar is part of the broader DOE Pathways to Commercial Liftoff Initiative. Earlier this year, we published reports covering clean hydrogen, long duration energy storage, advanced nuclear and carbon management technologies. The liftoff reports represent a department-wide initiative to strengthen engagement between the public and private sectors to accelerate the commercialization and deployment of key clean energy technologies. We aim to provide a common fact base for public and private sector investments and decision-making in that shared pursuit. Today, we are sharing preliminary content from our upcoming industrial decarbonization liftoff reports and very much look forward to your input and engagement as we continue to develop report content. Please send all questions or comments on this presentation to liftoff at hq.doe.gov. The industrial decarbonization liftoff effort will consist of three related reports, a cross-cutting wrapper report that covers eight industrial sectors, as well as two deep dive reports, one report covering chemicals and refining, and another on cement. Today, we will start with an overview of the scope for our industrial decarbonization liftoff reports an initial discussion of key messages from that work. After that, we will share some cross-sector insights. Here, we will show you all the details of how we are looking at industrial emissions at DOE, the results of our analysis on the range of decarbonization levers, and the cross-sector challenges that will need to be addressed as we pursue our net zero goals together. Finally, we will have our team take us through sector-level pathways to lift off for each of the eight industrial sectors the report will cover. These sector deep dives will arm listeners with the key context, decarbonization levers, and potential pathways for their specific areas of interest. Hopefully we've piqued your interest and you'll continue on with us through the remainder of this webinar. However, if you do have to leave early, a recording of this webinar will be available at liftoff.energy.gov. Before we begin, I want to emphasize our goals for this webinar, as well as cover a few disclaimers to keep in mind. This webinar is a high level overview of potential decarbonization pathways for US industrial sectors. It's based on our best available data today and represents the DOE's preliminary perspective on this topic, subject to further refinement, hopefully with your input via our liftoff at hq.doe.gov inbox. We intend to release the written reports later this year but as with previous liftoff reports, even when published, these will be living documents that continue to be updated frequently as the commercialization outlook across these technologies and sectors changes. This webinar is not a detailed discussion of any specific DOE programs, funding opportunities, or financial assistance matters. It is also not a technical overview of any specific decarbonization technologies. Please note that the DOE is only communicating public and non-privileged information during this webinar, and DOE will not be discussing the details of any specific program opportunity in this webinar. For example, requests for information, notices of intent, or funding opportunity announcements. Questions about specific DOE programs and funding opportunities should go to the relevant DOE office, and more information is available on energy.gov. With that, let's dive into the content. From an introduction, for an introduction into our scope, methods, and key messages, I'll hand it to my colleague, Teresa Christian from the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. Teresa? Thank you so much, Lucia. My name is Teresa Christian. I'm the Market and Energy Analysis Director at the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. And to kick off today, I'd like to walk us through the scope of today's webinar. We'll be focusing on the decarbonization of the processing and production emissions associated with eight industrial sectors of focus. First, chemicals. Next, refining, iron and steel, food and beverage, cement, pulp and paper, aluminum, and glass. As you'll see in detail later, these eight sectors represent some of the largest sources of emissions in the US today. 
And you can see from the chevrons the areas of focus um, for this analysis in terms of emissions. Now to address the to address the in-scope emissions across these sectors, we identified nine decarbonization levers of focus for the analysis shown here. These levers tie to DOE's industrial decarbonization roadmap pillars, as well as prior lift off reports on carbon management, clean hydrogen, and long duration energy storage. The nine levers are color coded based on the industrial decarbonization pillars that they represent, including carbon capture and storage, which includes hydrogen that's produced using CCS, industrial electrification, energy efficiency, and low carbon fuels, feedstocks, and energy storages, sources, which we've broken up into multiple dimensions, including electrolytic hydrogen, raw material substitution, alternative fuels beyond hydrogen, alternative production methods, and clean on-site electricity and storage. Finally, we also estimated the abatement of grid decarbonization as it complements the development of the other levers for decarbonization in this sector. One final note on these levers, for purposes of this analysis, we did not formally evaluate carbon utilization, although it is also a component of the carbon capture opportunity space. You will hear more about each of these levers, as well as their estimated abatement potential in 2030 and specific sector applications later in the presentation. In order to evaluate each of their roles, we used what is called a marginal abatement cost curve analysis. This analysis suggests one scenario for decarbonization activity in 2030, if we stay on path to net zero. The results provide a snapshot for what decarbonizations could offer the lowest cost abatement for each ton of emissions in 2030, based on our best available data from 2021 emissions and best estimates of what the cost might be for these levers. To do this, we've pulled generously from the existing liftoff reports that were recently published and mentioned earlier. However, we certainly know that a broader set of cost-effective solutions will be needed to fully decarbonize this sector and that emergent technologies will shape the pathway to net zero, particularly beyond 2030. For these reasons, we have every expectation of updating this analysis to reflect the best available information over time. And while we know that the final pathway to liftoff will change, this analysis is designed to offer a framework for one potential pathway which could advance industrial decarbonization progress in the near term, while also highlighting key insights and cross-cutting opportunity areas for advancement. Next, ahead of the full presentation, we wanted to walk you through a few of the key messages that came from this analysis and synthesis. First, U.S. industrial players are at risk of lagging behind net zero targets. However, this narrative is changing. With recent public sector support, including the bill and IRA materials, with increasing customer expectations to address emissions, and with early private sector movers in the space. Next, emerging decarbonization levers, including energy efficiency, industrial electrification, carbon capture and storage, and alternative fuels are estimated to be the least cost approaches to abate a portion of industrial emissions in 2030. And continued research development and demonstration of additional decarbonization levers, such as novel low carbon production methods, are needed to fully abate emissions, to lower overall costs, and to de-risk decarbonization by 2050. The potential capital deployment associated with these investments could be 700 billion to 1.1 trillion, which needs to come from public and private sector investments and to leverage and from leverage of industrial materials a small portion of end product price in order to decarbonize with emerging technologies. Early commercial deployments of decarbonization technologies in sector specific applications could drive cost reductions and cross-sector learnings to boost the value proposition of similar future projects. And clear end customer demand with speed industrial decarbonization, requiring action across supplier value chains to compete for market share and customer segments that value low carbon products. But don't take my word for it. I will now pass to my colleague, Kate Scott, 
to take you through additional detail behind these key messages. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. My name is Kate Scott. I'm a senior consultant and contractor with the Office of Technology Transitions. The next section will focus on cross-sector insights, including a deeper look at the emissions baseline used in this analysis and how DOE has been thinking about the challenge of industrial emissions. The results of the marginal abatement cost curve analysis and the potential role for decarbonization levers to reach net zero and DOE's preliminary view on cross-sector challenges to industrial decarbonization and what potential tactics could help the industrial sector move faster and be a leader in their industry. To start, we must identify the magnitude of industrial emissions in the US in 2021. Overall, the industrial sector accounted for 24% of US emissions. The eight sectors we focused on for this liftoff report account for 14% of overall US emissions. While we know these sectors have long been called hard to abate, Today, we will challenge that idea by detailing the many deployable and demonstration ready technologies for decarbonizing this space. While there are still technical and market challenges to scaling, without action, industrial emissions will continue to grow as a share of the US profile with the potential for over a quarter of US emissions to be from the industrial sector by 2030. Especially as other traditional large emitting sectors like transportation accelerate their decarbonization. To further define the problem, we will take a closer look at this 876 million tons of CO2 e emissions. First, we can look at the geographic profile for these emissions. Today, there are thousands of different facilities or point sources of emissions in the US. Each of these facilities have unique operational and capital plans, which must be considered when decarbonizing. While this map can be daunting, there is a concentration in the US with facilities in the South and Midwest, accounting for 80% of emissions from the sectors of focus. These concentrations serve as a starting point for many industrial hub proposals and other regionally focused efforts. Next, we can look at the aggregated view of emission sources across heat, process, and electricity in our eight sectors. This summary view is represented, representative of the entire set, but you will see later the exact sources vary significantly by sector. Heat emissions are from the use of heat in a facility, often done by burning fossil fuels today. Heat can be split across different temperature ranges, which each present a unique decarbonization challenge. Process emissions are from the chemical transformation of raw materials, sometimes requiring a new approach to decarbonize. And finally, electricity emissions are related to the power consumption of a facility. We include both on-site and off-site power. Taken together, we see that 70% of emissions are related to heat and process. These sources are the target of multiple decarbonization levers, which we will deep dive on in the next section. While electricity-related emissions will be lightly covered today, we recognize the importance of continued progress on de grid decarbonization as a cross-cutting requirement and enabling dimension for decarbonization via industrial electrification. Finally, we can look at the exact sectors driving these emissions. We include both the US footprint and the global footprint for comparison. We can see that chemicals and refining together represent over 60% of the US industrial emissions in our sectors of focus. This large footprint is one of the reasons that we are going to have a deep dive report that focuses on the pathway to liftoff for decarbonizing just these two US sectors. Beyond chemicals and refining, we see that iron and steel, food and beverage, cement, pulp and paper, aluminum, and glass each contribute to US industrial emissions and are part of a larger global footprint. For each of these, there is work to decarbonize domestically, which could be impactful in a global mission to reduce emissions. Additionally, to start our final section on sectors, we will highlight how players in each of these sectors have unique opportunities to lead their field and take charge of their decarbonization. So the last few slides defined our baseline for our emissions and the different ways that you can look at the same number. First, the source, especially heat and process, determines what technologies to consider. And second, the location and sector of emissions determine the implementation and pathway to commercial liftoff. The next section will focus on the possible role of each decarbonization lever to address these emissions. We'll share the results of our marginal abatement cost curve analysis including an estimate for the abatement potential of each of the levers 
based on current 2030 cost projections, a walkthrough of how DOE thinks about technology commercialization, and a snapshot of current readiness of these levers across sectors. Before we dive into the results, I wanted to quickly re-emphasize the nine decarbonization levers study. As Teresa mentioned, these nine were selected based on the pillars in DOE's industrial decarbonization roadmap and existing liftoff reports. We will show you that we can make progress on decarbonization today with these levers. Before we dive in, I wanna outline a few notable assumptions to keep in mind. First, carbon capture and storage. In the 45, we assume that uh, the 45Q tax credit and cost estimates for 2030 capture, transport, and storage from the carbon management liftoff report. For energy efficiency, our cost estimates are a suite of available sector-specific technologies. For electrolytic hydrogen, we assume the use of a 45V tax credit and cost, cost estimates from 2030 production, transport, and storage from the clean hydrogen liftoff report. For alternative production methods, costs are not estimated, and so the role for 2050 is assessed by sector. And for clean on-site power and storage, cost estimates are based on on-site solar with long duration energy storage and those costs from the LDES liftoff report. And then finally, for grid decarbonization, we assumed linear progress in the White House's 100% clean power 2035 goal. These assumptions underpin the analysis and our results, uh, which we'll share on the next page, and they create an estimated abatement potential that could be attributed to each lever in a 2030 scenario. We will see that all decarbonization levers have a role to play in decarbonizing emissions associated with industrial production processes. Even as each individual decarbonization lever pursues momentum towards widespread deployment, there won't be a role for all. For example, the commercial pathway for widespread deployment of carbon management technologies and clean hydrogen have been discussed at length in separate DOE liftoff reports. We need all these levers and new emerging technologies to reach full decarbonization 2050, especially as these 2030 cost estimates become 2030 cost actuals and technologies start to pursue scale deployment. So without further ado, Let's get to our preliminary results. This is an information dense slide, so I'm gonna take a second to orient you. Along the left, the nine decarbonization levers are categorized by addressed emission source and ordered from top to bottom based on the largest abatement potential. The bars are the estimated abatement potential in million tons of CO2 for each lever. This abatement potential is calculated by considering for each group of emissions across industry, source and facility, which decarbonization lever is estimated to be lowest cost in 2030. And we'll deep dive on those specific costs on the next page. Overall, you can see that with today's estimates and tax credits like 48Q and 45V, we find there is a role for CCS, industrial electrification, energy efficiency, and alternative fuels like hydrogen in 2030. These results support existing DOE work like the H2 roadmap, where the estimated about 75 million tons of CO2 abatement shown here ties to the roadmap's expectations for use in ammonia and refining by 2030. These results also indicate that CCS could abate emissions in 2030. However, other decarbonization levers and emerging technologies may address the same emissions as CCS with more research development and demonstration. We'll take a closer look at the various options shortly. And finally, since most alternative production pathways have limited economic data available today, their role in 2030 decarbonization was not assessed. But you'll see in each sector in our second half of this uh, webinar that there are alternative production pathways that play an important role in net zero by 2050. On the bottom of the page, we show an estimated capex representing the investment required for this scenario of abatement we can see that this would mean for between $700 billion and $1.1 trillion of potential CapEx to deploy these technologies. And on the next page, we'll explore the specific costs behind this abatement potential and why our analysis selected CCS and what this means for the path to net zero in industrial decarbonization for 2030 and beyond. And finally, 
we want to call out the need for emerging technologies uh, to abate 4% of emissions that there is currently today no near-term lever. And additionally, these emerging technologies could reduce the capex needed for full abatement in 2050. So another dense page. So I'll take a moment to walk us through. On the left, we've kept the decarbonization levers and the bars are still million tons of CO2. But now the abatement potential is segmented by the economic impact of abating each ton of CO2. Green tons are net positive to abate and gray tons represent added costs in 2030. The darker the gray, the more expensive. At the bottom, we include the percentage of overall emissions that can be abated for each cost range. We find that 15% of emissions studied can be abated today with net positive impact on the business. Said another way, these projects will bring double digit rates of return. It is unlikely to surprise many on this call, but energy efficiency measures are estimated to be the most economic in the short term. Meanwhile, other emissions can be abated with additional cost. Here we see that while CCS is the biggest in terms of abatement potential, it also represents the largest cost in a 2030 scenario. We'll double click into what this means. We can see that without swift new technology development in 2030, CCS could be the lowest cost to abate more than 30% of emissions. This estimate is driven by the fact that many of these assets have long asset lifetimes and infrequent downtimes, where CCS retrofits can be added to existing facilities and remove the need for expensive greenfield projects in the near term. Second, while CCS is high cost, most abatement um, levers that are above $50 per ton uh, could abate the same types of emissions and would still be more expensive than what's shown on the page, indicating a need for more development to drive competition. And third, for some emissions, there is actually an absence or limitation of commercially available technologies to address those emission, uh, same emissions. Again, emphasizing the need for more tools in the toolbox if we want a competition to drive low cost decarbonization. And finally, the sectors driving this use of CCS are mostly chemicals and refining, where we see many of the challenges mentioned above come to light in the limited options for some emission sources. This result is a call to action to further improve economics and start testing now. In order to accelerate net zero goals and lower costs we need a range of cost-effective solutions to pursue via cost reductions and demand side pull. Said another way, we need to work to increase the um, size of the green bars on this page. And in the next section, we'll share some example tactics, as well as uh, focus on the two areas of cost reductions and demand side pull. So we want to take you through one example of where a range of solutions uh, could make address the same emissions in a certain area. So on this page, we find that with continued cost reduction, other decarbonization levers may address the same emissions as CCS, including electrification, electrolytic hydrogen, and utilization of CO2. The technologies on the right-hand side still face higher costs or limitations in addressing the emissions that CO CCS is tagged to in our results. However, we're seeing that there could be multiple levers as economics improve. Many of the technologies on this page are part of continued development efforts and part of the decarbonization levers that we've mentioned already, and so can leverage continued R&D and focus on scale up to drive down costs. As we consider the variety of pathways to net zero, uh, needing both near term options that enable us to get started and diversified solutions for the longer term and full decarbonization will set us up for success. Now that we've talked about the role of technologies and the need for more tools, we want to discuss the role of demand momentum in enabling decarbonization. We showed on the first page of, this, of our results that this decarbonization scenario could require between 700 billion and $1.1 trillion of CapEx, a meaningful investment of capital for industrial players. However, here we want to illustrate that the industrial materials are often a small portion of the cost of final products, especially in the context of growing demand from end consumers for decarbonized products and supply chains. On the left, we see a timeline of how this demand has been growing and already started with uh, as little as eight years going by uh, to start with early movers demanding low carbon products 
people like Apple making commitments to buy low carbon aluminum and other signatories to industry consortia like First Movers and Frontier looking to strengthen demand. On the right, we illustrate how the cost to decarbonize for a supplier dilutes along the value chain to end products, typically the focus of low carbon demand. This connectivity presents a key challenge as end customer willingness to pay and connectivity to suppliers varies widely by product and market. However, there are encouraging examples in the market today, like the auto industry where green premiums are emerging for some steel products and large car makers are making public statements about their need for low carbon steel and traceability through the value chain. We will discuss the demand side more in the next section on cross-sector challenges. My final few slides are focused on how these decarbonization levers can develop to accelerate net zero and lower costs. I will start by briefly introducing two important concepts for technology commercialization, technology readiness and adoption readiness. Many of you have likely heard of technology readiness, which assesses the maturity of a particular technology, indicating if something is still in R&D or in pilot or in demonstration or commercially available phase. Another dimension is adoption readiness which focuses on other essential commercialization risk factors like value proposition, product market fit, demand pull, supply chain availability, and more. For more details on adoption readiness, if you're not familiar, you may want to check out the explanation at the link in the footnote or by going to the Office of Technology Transitions website. We will use these two ideas to assess the readiness of technologies across our decarb levers and sectors. So we use TRL and ARL to define three stages of commercialization, which you'll see throughout this presentation. First, we have R&D to pilot stage technologies where TRL and ARL are low. These rarely have clear economics, but as they develop, they could change the path to net zero. And as mentioned on the summary page, this group of emerging technologies is essential to reaching net zero. Without developments here, a portion of emissions may remain unabated. And today we found 4% of emissions had no levers to address. And second, as you can see on the page, we have demonstration ready technologies with high TRL um, and a need to develop the ARL to improve the uptake of technology and de-risk market factors. And finally, we have deployable technologies, which have high TRL and relatively high ARL, but may not be commercially fully commercially deployed today. Across each technology, especially in the deployable stage, it is important to consider how to use early projects to de-risk remaining ARL barriers and move these technologies squarely into the upper right. Now that I've introduced our classification, I will share the summary for our decarbonization levers across each of our sectors. So on this page, we have again repeated the decarbonization levers on the left, and now the sectors studied are on the top. Across this matrix, there are very there are specific technologies in each decarbonization lever that have different stages of commercialization. So first, there are deployable technologies. Unsurprisingly, considering the amount of net positive abatement estimated, energy efficiency has deployable levers across sectors. There are some solutions in raw material substitution, especially on recycling, which are also deployable. Second, we have demonstration ready technologies. Here we see CCS projects across sectors, as well as opportunities in hydrogen and some alternative production methods. And next we have R&D and pilot technologies, which are being developed in every sector and especially focus on hydrogen and electrification, as well as alternative production methods. Together and associate with these technologies and their associated cost estimates, we're able to estimate a sector level potential capex for decarbonization activities in 2030. In the final section on sector level insights, we will offer a more detail behind these estimates and uh, what abatement potential each technology and each stage could drive. This page will need to be updated as the pace of innovation is fast and we welcome feedback as more solutions are developed. So now we'll move into the final section of cross-sector insights on cross-sector challenges and solutions, including some example tactics for how to accelerate deployment in this space. So for the next section, I'll pass to my colleague, Kelly Visconti, to discuss the cross-sector challenges and potential solutions. Thank you, Kate. My name is Kelly Visconti. 
I'm the Acting Deputy Director for Facilities and Workforce Assistance in the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains. I'm also the Chair of the Industrial Joint Industrial Technologies Joint Strategy Team in DOE. Today, U.S. industry is at risk of lagging net zero targets. Across sectors, the goals of top U.S. industrial companies represent only 15% reduction in scope one and scope two U.S. industrial emissions by 2035. Even across sectors, market players cite common concerns driving reluctance to be a first mover. It can be a challenging value proposition. Many decarbonization levers for these sectors have high delivery costs and are complex to adopt. There's an uncertain level of market acceptance. There's an uneven demand for low carbon products. It's a challenging resource environment, including a lack of low cost, readily available infrastructure and aligned capital. On top of those broader market challenges, many sectors have limited options for limited options for mature technologies. And there are other sector specific challenges. However, this narrative is changing. Thanks in part to public sector support in the BIL and IRA, such as OSED's $6.2 billion for industrial decarbonization demonstration to deployment, the 48C Advanced Manufacturing Tax Credit, Advanced Energy Manufacturing and Recycling Grants, and funding to support research and development aligned to transformative solutions such as the Energy Earthshots Initiative. At the same time, customers' expectations for companies to address emissions are growing, was represented by the Federal Buy Clean Initiative and private sector demand signals for low carbon products coming from groups like the First Movers Coalition or Frontier. Some companies are making bold moves by accelerating the commercialization of decarbonization technologies with public sector support. They're expanding their offerings of low carbon domestic products and exports, and opportunistically capturing low carbon technology premiums. Let's take a closer look at some of these concerns and where they sit along the value chain. First, there's a set of challenges on the supply side. In many cases today, there's a high delivered cost of technology and subsequently a lack of first of kind build out for high abatement levers with low TRL or adoption readiness level. Many levers to decarbonize industrial processes are highly complex to adopt. There's a potential for delays during the integration of retrofits, and often these assets have tightly scheduled downtime windows. These sectors need a significant volume of capital, and investors often have perceived risks of retrofits and lower adoption readiness level technologies. This results in capital flow challenges, including a higher cost of capital and more favorable risk-adjusted returns to simply maintain existing assets. There are limited solutions that are technically viable and many have other barriers to adoption. Unlocking certain decarbonization solutions requires supporting infrastructure. A lack of enabling infrastructure like pipelines to support the technology adoption of carbon capture and use of low carbon feedstocks is an issue at many facilities. Next, we have the challenges on the customer side. Today, concerns often center on limited demand for low carbon products and related short-term decarbonization ambitions. Overall, emerging demand side pull for decarbonized products could increase pressure for robust decarbonization action across the supplier value chain. While these reasons are common across industry, there are tactics that can be used today to accelerate us towards net zero. Across each of the challenges I just walked through, there's action that both the public and private sector can take to help us achieve industrial decarbonization liftoff. Let's walk through these in more detail. First, to address the high delivered cost of technology, we must focus on closing the cost gap. This can be achieved by cost downs through demonstration projects, driving the important demand side through buy side consortia, as well as innovations in materials or manufacturing research and development they can really help drive costs down. To lower risk of adopting complex solutions, integrating this work into near and long-term capital planning is essential. Organizations can schedule a downtime of equipment to align with facility and equipment retrofit opportunities. And we can collectively develop and implement best practices for improved planning and replicability. Further advances in the manufacturing approaches 
can simplify construction and integration. Addressing infrastructure requirements will be essential. Expediting permitting bottlenecks and allowing for sufficient time in project planning is essential. Building and expanding regional hubs and common carrier infrastructure, including but not limited to things like the hydrogen hubs or carbon capture pipelines are another set of tools. In addition, industry must be able to secure financing. The market needs to provide risk mitigation measures to unlock equity and debt financing across different stages of technology development and scale up. It's important to better address transition risk in business case development. And again, demand side mechanisms where feasible, such as through optic agreements can increase the attractiveness of financial deals. And lastly, on the supply side, the industrial sector needs new innovative technical solutions, particularly pilot scale projects for low to high temperature clean heat, alternative fuels, raw material substitutions, and alternative production processes. For example, electrolytic based iron making or novel chemistries for cement. We need to identify sector specific opportunities and support development of earlier stage technologies. On the flip side, it's critical to shore up demand side pulls, like increasing awareness of embodied emissions throughout the supply chain, creating guaranteed offtake agreements for up to 100% of low carbon materials, defining green premiums for low carbon products, tracking and verifying systems for supply chains, and creating voluntary or statutory requirements for low carbon materials. The good news is that progress on these challenges will provide cross-cutting support for decarbonization across industrial sectors. However, we understand that to achieve commercial liftoff for technologies and achieve net zero, we cannot only discuss the cross-cutting takeaways. Each sector faces unique challenges and also offers unique leadership opportunities for liftoff. The next half of this webinar will start with Kate returning to introduce DOE's early synthesis of leadership opportunities by sector. This will be followed by an individual discussion of each of the eight sectors, highlighting a sector-specific pathway to liftoff and net zero. Back to you, Kate. Thank you, Kelly. For the next 40 or so minutes, members of the Pathway to Commercial Liftoff team will spend around five minutes providing whirlwind overviews of each sector of focus, covering the industry context, emission sources, specific decarbonization levers, and a synthesized pathway to liftoff. Like the rest of the webinar, these insights are preliminary, and many technologies sit in between stages of commercialization, where it can be hard to separate technologies that are R&D in pilot, demonstration, or deployable. Our goal in providing these synthesized views is not to predict the future, but instead to understand what types of activities would be timely to support a pathway to decarbonization liftoff across these sectors of focus. We will also be posting this video with clear navigation on liftoff.energy.gov for folks to review in, on their own time. So to kick off this section, the liftoff team has identified unique leadership opportunities for every sector to leverage on its journey to decarbonization. These consider a sect sector's position in the US economy, technology options, an emissions profile to determine their superpower when it comes to leading in a net zero world. So without further ado, we'll start off with chemicals. As the largest emitter of the sectors covered in this work, the US chemicals industry can use its market power to demonstrate world-class low carbon processing techniques domestically and as an opportunity to pursue a competitive advantage internationally. Next, the U.S. is the world's largest oil producer, which presents the U.S. refining sector a chance to be a global leader in the production, usage, and export of lower carbon intensity fuels, and to preserve their industrial base and retain the social license to operate. For iron and steel producers, they can scale their use of low carbon inputs to further solidify the U.S.'s position as a global leader in low carbon steel products. For the food and beverage industry, their relationship with consumers are a strong driver to leverage their position in educating the market of the benefits of decarbonization and to scale promising options for decarbonizing low temperature heat. In cement, 
they can capitalize on already economic levers to transform U.S. industry into a pioneer for net zero cement and innovative methods. The U.S. government also has a unique role to play here. As the largest procurement partner, there is a chance to signal demand for low carbon products. In paper and pulp, market leaders can achieve low temperature heat decarbonization and even reach carbon negative operations with CCS retrofits. And in aluminum, there's a chance to reach infinite recycling. The sectors can also build out cost-effective clean power and to produce carbon-free materials, as well as de-risking the US import reliance. And finally, for glass industry, there can be unlocked solutions to decarbonize high temperature heat and set a precedential roadmap for other industrial sectors that rely on heat intensive processes. Next, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Marisa Brennan. Thanks, my name is Marisa Brennan and I'm in the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations on the Portfolio Strategy Team. We will kick off the sector deep dives by looking at chemicals, which has the largest sector share of 2021 CO2 E emissions from the eight industrial sectors covered in this work. The chemical sector accounted for roughly 3% of US CO2 E emissions in 2021 or 315 million tons and accounts for 35% of emissions of the sectors in focus. The US down, downstream chemical sector provides essential inputs to widely used products, including plastics and pharmaceuticals, both within the US and worldwide. Chemicals is actually the largest US export sector. The industry is highly concentrated with, dom with domestic production of bulk petrochemicals led by five primary producers who make up nearly 50% of the US market. Chemicals are produced at over 10,000 production facilities across the full value chain and production processes vary widely across chemical products. However, roughly 60% of emissions are attributed to four processes, those being natural gas processing, ammonia production, ethylene production, and core alkali processing. As of April, 2023, 10 of the largest 15 chemical companies across subsectors have made decarbonization commitments ranging from 15 to 50% scope one and two emissions reductions by 2035. <clears throat> the chemical sector emissions come from three primary sources, heat generation, which makes up roughly 40%, electricity, roughly 29%, and process emissions, another 24%. The remaining 7% comes from various other sources, such as fugitive emissions. While chemicals production has fragmented emission sources, approximately 80% of these operational emissions originate from on-site on -site point sources. Because of the fragmented nature of chemical emission sources, the sectors will need to pull a variety of abatement levers with significant roles for CCS and equipment electrification powered by clean electricity. But these levers are expensive, with costs ranging from roughly $110 to $140 per ton of CO2E for CCS on dilute, dilute flue gas streams, and for the electrification of equipment ranging from a net positive $50 after IRA tax incentives to a $70 cost per ton of CO2E. In addition to the 2023 projected economics, the pathway to liftoff considers the current stage of the decarbonization technologies across the industry. Without widespread implementation of these decarbonization levers, chemicals will continue to be a major contributor to U.S. emissions, with the sector emissions potentially even rising by 35% in a 202050 business as usual pathway due to market growth. Most companies are implementing efficiency solutions, with some making exploratory investments in projects to decarbonize production. This slide shows the development of stages of the levers across the U.S. chemical sector. For example, ammonia players have expanded plans for clean hydrogen facilities, incentivized by the 45Q and 45V tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act. However, efficiency and clean hydrogen may only address 10% of the required abatement for the sector to achieve deep decarbonization. So it's important for industry to look beyond levers that are economically viable today. Based on industry momentum, 
available decarbonization levers, and current technology maturity, a pathway to liftoff in chemicals processing decarbonization will need to leverage a portfolio of options to reduce its carbon footprint, all while supporting the continued growth and cross-border sales. Technologies that are deployable today include the electrification of natural gas processing, producing and using electrolytic hydrogen in ammonia production enabled by the 45V tax credit, and retrofitting natural gas processing plants with CCS. Beyond the decarbonization levers that are deployable today, the chemical sector will need to reach economies of scale for low temperature heat electri electrification to be competitive with fossil fuel boilers and burners, close the CC CCS cost gap on dilute flue streams, and advance biofeedstocks for chemicals, among others. To achieve a net zero pathway by 2050, the sector will need to advance alternative steam cracker technologies to be competitive with fossil fuel powered processes and develop alternative production methods. These activities all in could require 400 to $600 billion in capital investment through 2050. However, this pathway could change as new technologies and solutions to decarbonize are introduced. The next sector we will be covering is refining. Production emissions from the refining sector accounted for roughly 2% of US CO2E emissions in 2021, or 242 million tons, which is approximately 27% of emissions from the sectors in focus. Refining production is spread across nearly 130 refineries nationwide, with more than 40% of capacity concentrated in the top five players. US refineries primarily produce two product groups. Uh, one, fuels for transportation, which account for more than 90% of U.S. refined fuel products, and two, other petrochemical processes, both of which are historically critical components of U.S. energy security. The U.S. produced 20% of global refined oil and was the world's top producer in 2022. The typical refining process consists of three primary steps. One, separating crude oil into different compounds. Two, converting lower lower value components into higher value ones through molecular rearrangement, and three, finishing to improve quality through blending products to get an optimal mix and treating. Of the nine largest refining companies by market share, six have made decarbonization commitments that range from 30 to 50% reduction in scope one and scope two emissions by 2035. Refining sector emissions come from three primary sources, heat generation, which is a combined almost 58%, electricity of on-site and, on on and off-site power, which is roughly 24%, and process emissions, another 18%. Roughly 90% of these operational emissions originate from on-site point sources. The decarbonization levers with high abatement potential for the refining sector include CCS and industrial electrification supported by clean electricity sources. However, refineries produce multiple sources of CO2E with varying concentrations, making decarbonization levers like CCS very complex to implement. Additionally, these solutions are expensive. CCS costs range from roughly $80 per ton of CO2E on the low end for CCS on concentrated flue streams, such as steam methane reformers, to $130 per ton of CO2E on the high end for more dilute streams like those associated with fluid catalytic converters or FCC and sources of process heat. And it could cost between $110 to $130 per ton of CO2E for on-site clean electricity and storage after IRA incentives, including 45Q, 45V, and 48E. Similar to chemicals, the pathway to liftoff in refining considers the current stage of the decarbonization technologies across the industry. Without widespread implementation of these decarbonization levers, refining will continue to be a major contributor to U.S. emissions. Refining emissions could grow anywhere from 5 to 10 percent by 2050 in a business-as-usual scenario. Most companies are implementing energy efficient, energy efficient solutions, but this may only address 10 percent of the required abatement for the sector to achieve net zero. Some companies are making exploratory investments in projects to decarbonize production, and this slide shows development stages of levers across U.S. refining. 
For example, some players have initiated demos of CCS on steam methane reformers to produce hydrogen from nat natural gas incentivized by the 45Q tax credit. U.S. refineries can set the industry standard for decarbonization by scaling and developing new products, such as bio-based fuels to preserve the industrial base, retain the social license needed to operate, and become a global leader in clean fuel production. Near term, refineries can adopt best available technologies at more than 130 locations, produce and use clean hydrogen, and scale the production of sustainable fuels. By 2040, they will need to achieve cost competitiveness in electrifying combined heat and power, close the CCS cost gap on dilute streams, such as FCCs and process heat, and mature modular nuclear reactor technologies to achieve cost competitiveness with fossil fuel powered combined heat and power. To abate the remaining emissions by 2050, the refining sector will need to mature sustainable fuels made with decarbonized production methods and capture emerging green premiums for low carbon fuels. The US refining pathway to the commercial liftoff could require 200 to $300 billion in capital investment through 2050 to scale decarbonization technologies. Given the scale of emissions from the combined chemicals and refining sectors, the liftoff effort will be publishing an additional report that takes a deep dive look specifically at the net zero pathways for these two sectors. We've decided to look at the two sectors together given many of their processes and decarbonization levers overlap. Part of that deeper analysis includes a marginal abatement cost curve or MAC, uh, which can help illuminate the comparative economics of decarbonization measures. The analysis includes comparing the economics of various technologies that could be used to decarbonize each source of emissions, selecting the least cost source measure and then lining up the full suite of measures required to decarbonize the industry based on cost to abate with a 10% return. It's important to note that MAC analysis should not be seen as definitive. It only considers a snapshot in time and one possible set of options. It does not represent the unique set of considerations each company uses when deciding how to decarbonize a facility. DOE has conducted this MAC analysis by looking at the least cost path forward which again may not necessarily be representative of the decisions individual companies will make. There are hundreds of input assumptions, all of which will be detailed in the modeling appendix of the report to be published at the end of the summer. However, it can be helpful in understanding economic challenges for each decarbonization lever. To understand the MAC figure we have on screen, um, the width of the bar shows the amount of emissions that could be decarbonized through the individual measure, while the height of the bar represents the cost to implement that measure. The measures on the left side of the chart with a negative cost represent measures that will be value accretive to implement with a 10% or higher return. This version of MAC analysis looks at technologies we expect to be available in 2030 and assumes the tax incentives of the IRA. Uh, there's definitely a lot to digest here, but at a high level, we can see that efficiency upgrades are the most cost additive lever on the left hand side of the chart. However, as a narrow bar do not abate a considerable amount of emissions. Conversely, CCS on chemical processes such as steam crackers for ethylene is a wider bar indicating a high abatement potential, but it's also the most expensive lever in this model on the far right side of the chart. I will now turn it over to Andrew Gilbert to cover iron and steel. Hi, I'm Andrew Gilbert, Senior Techno-Economic Analyst at the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. The iron and steel industry accounted for 1% of total US CO2 e emissions in 2021, or around 90 million tons of CO2. US crude steel production is projected to grow at 2% per year through 2030, driven by increased demand from building, construction, automotive, and energy sectors. Decarbonization within iron and steel will depend on continued transition toward lower carbon iron making and steel making routes. Within the US, there are two primary production routes, integrated blast furnace and basic oxygen furnaces, BOF, BOF, and electric arc furnaces, which are also known as mini mills. Both routes use a mix of three iron inputs to produce molten steel. Pig iron from blast furnaces produced from coping coal and iron ore, direct reduced iron or hot briquetted iron known as DRI-HBI, 
which are produced from iron ores using natural gas or potentially hydrogen reductants and scrap. As the birthplace of and world leader in mini mills, the US has been gradually shifting production from BFBOFs to EAFs, which today account for around 70% of production. The EF production route is less carbon intensive, but will likely face increased resource constraints from limited domestic prime scrap availability. This will require further use of either higher carbon pig iron or DRI HBI. Remaining US blast furnaces account for only 30% of production or represent 70% of sector CO2 emissions. All US BF BOFs are owned and operated by two large integrated steelmakers, Cleveland Cliffs and US Steel. Depicted here are four possible paths for deep decarbonization in iron and steel in the medium term, with more nascent technologies listed on the right. As a flag, these costs are preliminary and incorporate tax credits like 45V and 45Q. Starting on the left, while there are some efficiency opportunities for BFBOF decarbonization, retrofitting integrated facilities with CCS can have the largest impact on their emissions. The Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management is currently funding studies on operability there. Moving over, scrap with EAF is the lowest emissions pathway currently available. However, the scrap market uh, will continue to tighten and will likely need to supplement scrap with alternative iron units like DRI, HBI, in order to meet the demand for clean steel. Moving right, lower carbon uh, direct reduced iron, the second and third bars can come from either direct reduction with natural gas and CCS or using hydrogen as reductant. We foresee opportunities for both routes in the US with decarbonization impacted by local geology, i.e. storage availability, uh, the availability of clean hydrogen and the facilities underlying technology. For instance, two of the leading DRI technology providers engineer plants with different flue streams. One produces a flue stream with a concentration of around 60%, while another has a CO2 concentration of around 50%, leading to potentially different preferences in decarbonization routes. As we look toward the long term, there are a range of technologies like molten oxide electrolysis that offer alternative options for decarbonized steel. In the next few pages, I will deep dive on decarbonization for blast furnaces due to their high share of emissions. Looking at the BFBOF emissions responsible for 70% of US and iron and steel emissions, around 80% of those emissions are heat related, mostly stemming from coking coal combustion. Around 90% of BFBOF emissions uh, result from iron making that can be addressed with CCS retrofits, reducing reliance on high carbon inputs, e.g. pig iron or raw material substitution with DRI HBI routes we just discussed, or electrification, i.e. shifting more steel making production to EAFs. Today in iron and steel, we're seeing ongoing momentum for clean steel in the US. With blast furnaces implementing waste heat recovery today, ongoing EAF growth, additional plans for DRI and HBI facilities, announcements for natural gas with DRI, uh, with CCS, and global activity around hydrogen DRI. However, transition in iron and steel will take time and investment. Deep decarbonized paths such as blast furnaces with CCS or DRI with CCS or H2 have not been demonstrated at scale here and are reliant on offtake in CCS and clean H2 industries with alternative production pathways further afield. The next decade will be critical. Key offtakers such as the auto industry and construction can spur deep demand for decarbonization and public and private investment can accelerate the process. This final page summarizes a pathway to lift off for the iron and steel industry. There is an opportunity for the US iron and steel to provide further uh, low carbon iron making inputs to solidify the US's position as a global leader in low carbon steel products. Across these technologies, there are a few stages and key enablers. In the near term, we can drive adoption of the best technology at remaining a BFBOF facilities. We can increase low carbon DRI HBI production and increase scrap resourcing. We can continue to migrate production towards EAF routes. At the same time, we can use demonstrations to lower costs of CCS on BF, BOF facilities and natural gas DRI with CCS through policy supports like 45Q and by growing CCS transport and storage infrastructure. On the R&D front, we can diversify 
uh, decarbonization options for steel by reducing the cost of electrolyzers, scale alternative iron making processes like iron electrolysis, and support EAF technology development to be able to produce all grades of steel. Overall, this could represent between $25 and $40 billion of investment in the sector. I will now turn it over to Kate Scott to cover food and beverage. Great. Thanks, Andrew. To round out the first half of our sector overviews, we now turn to food and bet, or just F&B. Food and beverage processing accounted for about 1% of overall U.S. CO2e emissions in 2021, or 85 million tons, about 8 about 10% of emissions from our sectors of focus. Processing generally represents less than 10% of the total value chain emissions across food and beverage products. However, as you can see from the left-hand chart, even this amount of food and beverage uh, emissions represents something meaningful in terms of the overall industrial emissions in the United States. On the farm or agricultural emissions, transportation, packaging, retail, and post-consumer activities are all out of scope for this analysis but there are major opportunities for decarbonization in, this, in these areas that are under further investigation. Food and beverage processing in the US involves a wide range of activities aimed at transforming raw agricultural materials into consumable food and drink products. There are thousands of food and beverage products across 10 major groups, including meats, dairy, beverages, fruits, vegetables, grains, and oil seeds, and many more. Food and beverage products are produced in over 35,000 different facilities across the U.S., which creates a unique challenge for decarbonization. And almost 90% of large food and beverage players have decarbonization commitments that span all these facilities, but also in many cases, farms. Short-term rate targets range from 10 to 40% reduction in scope one and two emissions by 2035. Many of these sustainability efforts at major food and beverage players are focused on agriculture activities, so today we want to spend a bit of time on what could be done to address the in the fence or scope one and two emissions. Next, I'll share a bit more detail about food and beverages emissions baseline. On this page, you can see that the processing sector for food and beverage, the emissions come from two primary sources, 50% from low temperature heat generation and 50% from electricity. On the next page, we'll dive into how these could be addressed. So there is a set of decarbonization levers that can address the, both the heat and electricity emissions today, including energy efficiency, electrification of heating equipment, including boilers, ovens, and fryers, alternative forms of fuel in the form of biomass, and grid decarbonization. Energy efficiency solutions across several segments of food and beverage processing, for example, steam generation or process cooling, can be relatively inexpensive with potential for operational cost savings due to more efficient processes. There are remaining levers such as electrification that are more expensive with costs ranging from 70 to $110 a ton of CO2e for electric boilers or heat pumps. Next, I'll dive into the operational momentum across these levers and a few more. On this page, we can see that there are deployable technologies in energy efficiency, especially waste energy recovery, as well as industrial electrification in terms of electric boilers. There are demonstration ready technologies in uh, the biomass of and other equipment and in boilers. And then there are R&D across biomass and other equipment and uh, electric, electrolytic hydrogen and alternative production methods. One thing to note is that water usage is particularly intensive in food and beverage processing. And so waste water treatment, recovery and reuse could reduce a facility's water consumption and carbon footprint. On the next page, we bring together the industry momentum, available decarbonization levers, and current maturity to create a pathway to liftoff for the U.S. food and beverage sector. We believe that the U.S. food and beverage sector would be well positioned to lead decarbonization activities by activating the consumer side pull and growing business by educating consumers on decarbonization benefits and implementing solutions, and especially scaling options for low temperature heat decarbonization. In the near term, there is likely to be a focus on energy efficiency and electrification, where enabling these technologies looks like fully implementing the best available technologies, especially within efficiency at many all food and beverage processing facilities. And also coordinating the emissions reduction plans in food and beverage across scope one, two, and three. 
And then finally, focusing on reducing low cost for, temp for low temperature heat electrification to be competitive with other heat sources. In the demonstration category, alternative fuels could be increased to decarbonize low temperature heat even further. And finally, there are solutions across clean hydrogen, electrification of other equipment, or alternative production that can continue to be researched and piloted in order to further drive decarbonization in this sector. All in all, these activities could require between five and $15 billion in capital investment through 2050 to scale. However, like other sectors, this would change as additional technologies and solutions to decarbonize are introduced. With that, I'll pass it to Sam Goldman for cement. Thanks, Kate. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sam Goldman. I'm an advisor and contractor to the Loan Programs Office at DOE, and I'm going to walk through some of our preliminary work on low carbon cement. Um, so just for background, cement is a key ingredient in concrete, the most widely consumed man-made material on Earth, uh, and is vital for a wide range of construction and infrastructure activity, housing and other buildings, roads, highways, bridges, and the like. Um, we look at the emissions profile, cement production accounted for around 70 million tons of CO2 emissions in 2021. It's around 1% of total US emissions and around 8% of emissions from the sectors in focus today. Um, the deep dive today focuses on primary production of cement at the plant, but also important not to lose sight of the broader value chain. How cement is used to make concrete and concrete is then used in construction uh, where there are major additional and complementary approaches uh, and opportunities for decarbonization as well. Um, two other points of context that we'll flag here. One is just looking internationally, um, you know, cement is around 1% of US CO2 emissions, but closer to 7 or 8% of emissions worldwide uh, on the order of 3.5 billion tons a year. Um, so a really important sector, not just for achieving net zero in the US, but also a major opportunity for international leadership um, and commercializing and exporting key technologies to accelerate decarbonization worldwide. And then just in terms of market context, uh, one of the unique things about cement is that government procurement accounts for around 50% of the US market. Um, for example, from federal and state spending on infrastructure and public buildings. So the public sector has a really important role to play here in moving the market. Um, we actually look at where those emissions are coming from. Um, you know, from a, from a production standpoint, we're talking about a fairly consistent model uh, raw material, chiefly quarried and crushed limestone, is processed at high heat in a rotary kiln to produce clinker. Uh, that clinker is then cooled, ground, and blended with other materials to produce the final cement mix, uh, which is then used in concrete and construction. And when we look at that emissions profile and, and where the emissions actually come from, around 85% are coming either from the fuels combusted to produce the high heat at which that process occurs or from the chemical process itself uh, by which cement is made from carbonated limestone. Uh, and so we're seeing a range of approaches that are emerging to address this emissions profile. Uh, for heat, we can look in the shorter term to measures like increased use of alternative lower carbon fuels, things like biomass and waste, um, and in the longer term, potentially to use of hydrogen or electrification for parts of the process. For those chemical process emissions, uh, we can look to alternative production methods for traditional cement products, this is things like electrochemical production, um, use of some alternative non-carbonate feedstocks, or to alternative cement chemistries altogether. Uh, or we can look to capture those emissions uh, with CCS. Um, we can also use CCS to address some of those residual emissions from heat. And then finally, there are a number of cross-cutting interventions that can reduce emissions by improving production efficiency, as well as some additional cross-cutting levers that can reduce overall emissions for the sector and across the value chain by reducing clinker consumption. And so that's increasing the use of substitutes to reduce clinker content in cement blends, uh, reducing cement content in concretes, and then concrete consumption in sort of end construction projects. In terms of the economics, uh, as we look down the column on the right-hand side, the story here is, you know, there's an initial set of levers that seem to have more favorable economics today, um, either in the money or pretty close, depending on site and market-specific conditions. These are going to be approaches like efficiency measures and some of those clinker and fuel substitution levers as well. Um, uh, with CCS, you know, we see potential for significant incremental costs here, especially for the earlier deployments, even where uh, there's that $85 per ton of 45Q support. Um, and then there's a set of sort of more nascent interventions, things like alternative production methods and more novel chemistries, where the economics are still emerging and there's still considerable uncertainty, but there is potential for a strong economic case as well. 
So looking at um, actual momentum in the space, again, some of those initial levers, things like efficiency, alternative fuels, and clinker substitution already seem to be deployable. Um, others like CCS and alternative production methods are moving towards demonstration. And then you have some other levers that remain sort of earlier in the R&D and pilot stage. So our emerging perspective is that we could see a four track pathway to liftoff uh, where different technologies achieve scale and commercialization in different ways and on different timelines. First, we have a set of initial measures that um, you know, we think can get us 30 to as much as 60% of the way there. This is things like efficiency, clinker substitution and alternative fuels um, generally at high TRL and high ARL today and likely scalable rapidly with some targeted support particularly accelerated testing and validation of low clinker blends, uh, and then demand pull from low carbon procurement standards as well. Second, to get at those remaining emissions, um, we could see large scale deployment of CCS, starting with some initial demonstrations and deployments in the mid to late 2020s and accelerating through the 2030s. Um, policies such as the 45Q tax credit and coordinated procurement of low carbon materials are likely to play a critical role in enabling that scale up. And then in parallel to CCS, you know, we could see scale up of alternative production methods uh, for cement products as well that will be consistent with sort of the existing standards in place. Um, and here in terms of timeline, you know, initial commercial scale deployments could also be planned for the mid to late 2020s um, with aspirations to get to scale in the 2030s. Again, coordinated procurement of low carbon materials likely gonna be critical here in creating the demand signal that's needed to mobilize capital for these projects and particularly um, and unlocking some of those initial deployments. And then finally, for some of the truly novel chemistries, um, alternatives to traditional cement products, we could see a fourth track uh, with scale up likely achieved on a longer time horizon. The key limiting factor here is, is likely to be lead time for new products to see standards and specifications updated um, and to build trust with risk averse customers. Um, so we could see some initial opportunities for novel chemistries to build an initial market share in um, non-structural niches where there might be more appetite for risk and for use of new materials, followed by full-scale deployment once standards and customer preferences shift, um, we're potentially talking on the order of a decade or more out. Um, so next I'll, I'll pass to Andrew Gilbert from our Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. Thank you, Sam. The U.S. pulp and paper sector provides a range of end products, including container board, tissue and towel, printing and writing, pulp and carton board. The industry accounted for less than 1% of U.S. CO2E emissions in 2021, or around 50 million tons of CO2. It is also the source of around 100 million tons per annum of related biogenic emissions. There are over 400 paper mills in the U.S. that produce different end products, with container board being the largest share. The pulping process is responsible for around 60% of sectoral emissions from dryers, burners, boilers, and evaporators. And the production of paper consists of three primary steps. Pulping, which includes debarking, chipping, followed by digesting and bleaching and drying. Paper making, which includes feeding the pulp into various paper machines and converting to corrugator sheets, box plants, or tissues. The pulp and paper sector emissions come from two primary sources heat generation, which is responsible for 70%, and electricity, with low temperature heat accounting for over 50% of emissions. Decarbonization levers include energy efficiency, such as improved separations technologies, leveraging alternate fuels like residual biomass and electrification. These have a wide range of abatement costs in a capital intensive sector. Most energy efficiency levers, e.g. real-time energy management systems and air dryers, are net positive, however, do not always clear the industry's high hurdle rates, which can be up to 25%. Alternative fuels, uh, e.g. biomass and electrification levers, can range from around $100 to $160 per ton of CO2 abated. Hydrogen burners, boilers, and alternative fuels like biomass gasification and pyrolysis are in the R&D stage with emerging economics. While many decarbonization levers exist at commercial scale, there's room to accelerate the adoption of best practices, including advanced membranes for separations, combusting residual biomass, increasing recycling, and electrifying heat. Pulp and paper also has the opportunity to incorporate CCS on black liquor boilers, 
thereby driving negative emissions via BECS. In the near term, we can accelerate commercialized energy efficiency technologies and combustion of waste biomass for heat and power, support demonstrations of low temperature heat, uh, like with industrial heat pumps and better separations membranes, while supporting efforts to adopt CCS for biogenic emissions. And on the R&D front, pilot biomass gasification and pyrolysis for clean hydrogen and sustainable aviation fuel off-takers to create new revenue opportunities for the sector. And now back to Kate. Thanks, Andrew. Next, we'll focus on aluminum in the United States. In 2021, the industry accounted for less than 1% of US CO2 emissions or about 16 million tons, less than 2% of emissions from the sectors of focus. But there's a larger global emissions of about 1,100 million tons. The US primary and secondary aluminum products are used by automotive packaging and energy sectors with US demand expected to rise due to energy transition technologies like solar PV frames, inverters and batteries, as well as increased EV uptake supported by tax credits like 45X and 48C. Today, the US relies on significant foreign imports for primary aluminum, mostly from Canada, as domestic production has declined significantly in the last 25 years. The US was a global leader in primary aluminum production through 2000, but by 2021 was the ninth largest producer, less than 1 million tons per annum, driven by high energy prices. As of 2021, 65% of aluminum production in the US was secondary production. Major aluminum players have made decarbonization commitments for 2035 goals, ranging from 20 to 50% reduction in scope one and two emissions, with some aluminum smelters not currently having short-term decarbonization targets. The U.S. has also been increasing the use of recycled content in secondary aluminum production, as well as building new recycling capacity. In terms of the emissions baseline for aluminum, we are looking across three main steps. Aluminum refining, which consists of refining on alumina from bauxite oxide. Aluminum smelting, which consists of converting alumina into primary aluminum metal through electrolysis and secondary aluminum production, which consists of combining primary aluminum metals with aluminum scrap through casting, rolling, extruding, and other surface treatments, create a fine aluminum product. Overall smelting accounts for 70% of aluminum industry emissions, um, and there's only six remaining smelters in the US, which are owned and operated by three players. So when we look at this in terms of the emission source, we see that across aluminum, there are three primary sources with 31% coming from heat generation, 17% of emissions from process, and 52% from electricity. Taken together, there is a set of decarbonization levers with high abatement potential today, including grid decarbonization, energy efficiency, and CCS on smelting, specifically on the Hall who wrote electrolysis process. Energy efficiency solutions in alumina refining, aluminum smelting, and secondary aluminum processing are relatively inexpensive with potential for operational cost savings due to more efficient processes. Remaining levers include CCS on electrolysis, However, it is significantly more expensive due to low CO2 concentrations with costs of $140 to $290 per ton of CO2E after IRA incentives. Alternative production methods like an anode could potentially be an alternative to CCS to capture aluminum smelting process emissions. Next, like other sectors, we'll look at the operational momentum behind these levers. We see today that energy efficiency, especially heat recovery, is already deployable along with uh, activities in raw material substitution like increasing scrap usage and industrial electrification by electrifying low temperature heat. We also see demonstration ready technologies like increasing Zorba processing in raw material substitution and inert anode processing for alternative production methods. There's also work in terms of R in R&D and piloting on CCS for smelting processes and electrolytic hydrogen and things like H2 calciners. 
like other sectors, will end on a pathway to liftoff for aluminum based on industry momentum, available levers, and current maturity. Overall, the sector has a unique opportunity to lead decarbonization by reaching infinite recycling as materials can be reused without loss of quality if the supporting recycling supply chain can be developed. There's also an opportunity to build out cost-effective clean power and show how this can enable very low carbon products. And then finally, as we build out uh, aluminum decarbonization pathways in the United States, we can de-risk US import reliance. We'll get there in a few stages. First, by thinking about deployable technologies today and pushing for best available technology adoption at remaining aluminum facilities in the United States, as well as continuing to divert post-consumer scrap from landfill into aluminum reprocessing. And finally, competing for cost reductions in low temperature heat electrification um, versus fossil fuel burners. The next section is on demonstration ready technologies and focusing on raw material substitution and alternative production methods, um, where we would increase the domestic processing of scrap and for example, the Zorba, and then maturing the inert anode processing to be cost competitive with existing options. And finally, there is R&D and pilot technologies in this area to focus on like CCS on smelters, high temperature heat electrification, um, and additional electrification of other parts of the process and the use of hydrogen. The focus would be on reducing the costs of CCS at these smelters via demonstrations, 45Q incentives, and infrastructure, um, and reducing costs of high temperature heat electrification and maturing alternative production methods. Overall, as with other industries, key off-takers can spur activity in this space by strengthening low carbon demand signals um, and clarifying for suppliers the value of implementing some of these technologies. Taken together, this pathway to liftoff could require 10 to $15 billion in capital investment through 2050 to scale decarbonization technologies, which could change, again, as additional information on technologies and their costs emerge. Thank you. And for the last section, I'll pass it to Charles Gertler. Thanks, Kate. I'm Charles Gertler. I'm a senior advisor and contractor to the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office. And for our last sector in this webinar, we will focus on the glass industry. So while the US is a leading importer of glass worldwide, the domestic glass industry accounted for 11 megatons of CO2 equivalent emissions which is about 1.2% of uh, emissions from the sectors of focus in this report and less than 1% of overall emissions in the US in 2021. Of the four main types of glass, flat glass and container glass are the largest segment, segments of the sector by volume. And those are followed, followed by specialty glass and fiberglass. It is growth in solar panel and construction glass demand that's driving growth in flat glass usage, and it is consumer trends that are driving growth in container glass usage. So though glass is the smallest contributor to overall emissions that we're discussing today, the industry has made pretty notable decarbonization commitments. Two thirds of large glass companies have set targets of between 15 and 50% of emissions reductions by 2035. Let's talk quickly about the glass making pro process to set the stage here. So the glass making process has four main steps. First is batch preparation. So in this step, silica, soda ash, and limestone are mixed. The second is melting and fining. So here the material mixture is heated to melting point in a furnace. The third is forming in which uh, molten glass is shaped to end product specifications. And finally, the last step is post forming and finishing. In this step, the finished product is inspected before undergoing any necessary finishing processes. So overall, these steps lead to emissions mainly from high temperature heat generation, which you can see on this page uh, account for 47% of overall emissions. Electricity use, and in particular, off-site power production is a similarly large proportion of overall glass industry emissions at 44%, and process emissions account for the remaining 9% of 
of glass emissions. To address emissions from high temperature heat in glass production, that largest chunk that we just looked at, the decarbonization levers include switching fuel to either biomethane or hydrogen, electrification coupled with grid decarbonization, energy efficiency in the form of waste heat recovery or what's called oxy-fuel furnaces and CCS. And oxy-fuel furnaces um, have the lowest abatement costs in this category. Those range from roughly 10 to $140 per ton CO2 equivalent of emissions abated. To address process emissions, raw material substitution and recycling is the main decarbonization lever. And this has relatively low abatement costs at roughly 30 to $50 per ton CO2 equivalent. Uh, it's important to note here that because glass is 100% recyclable and it can be recycled endlessly without decreases in quality or purity, recycled glass or what's called cullet can be used to substitute up to 95% of raw materials. Finally, the main lever to address electricity emissions is grid decarbonization. And that's because glass industry electricity emissions are predominantly from offsite generation as we saw on the previous slide. Let's turn now to the momentum landscape in this space. So to achieve the decarbonization commitments um, set forth here, the glass industry is currently focused on adopting oxyfuel furnaces, which are a mature and deployable technology, uh, as well as um, uh, the industry is also focused on increasing cullet usage. Um, this is challenged to some extent uh, in the US by low glass recycling rates. Other technologies for decarbonizing high temperature heat include electrification, CCS, alternative fuels, and hydrogen as mentioned. And these are currently at the demonstration, pilot, or R&D stages. Finally, I'll note that additional technologies like thermal energy storage may provide network benefits that accelerate the deployment of technologies to decarbonize high temperature heat by improving their business case, providing flexibility, and balancing energy demand and supply. Our current perspective is that the US glass decarbonization pathway to liftoff could require five to $15 billion in capital investment through 2050 to scale the technologies necessary to eliminate emissions from the sector in three distinct tracks. In the near term to 2035, 50% of emissions can be abated through the use of deployable technologies, things like raw material substitution, oxy fuel furnaces, and waste heat recovery. And those all coupled with uh, grid decarbonization. In the medium term to 2040, a second track here that can abate 25 to 40% of emissions can be achieved through deploying technologies that are currently in the demonstration phase. So these are things like CCS, alternative fuel, electrification, as well as more advanced techniques for cullet usage. Um, it's also our perspective that building out the recycling supply chain will be a large component and enabler of this effort. Finally, to 2050, Deploying technologies that are currently in the R&D and pilot stage could abate the remaining 10 to 25% of emissions in the industry, uh, enabled by process and equipment substitution technology that will be proven out in the coming decades. So with that, thus concludes this webinar on the pathways to commercial liftoff for industrial decarbonization. On behalf of all of our presenters, I want to thank you all for your time. We hope you'll go to liftoff.energy.gov for more information. And please shoot us an email at liftoff at hq.doe.gov about what we got right, what we got wrong. The industrial decarbonization landscape is evolving quickly and we want these to reflect the best and latest information from across the industry. We're looking forward to working together to achieve liftoff. Thanks very much.